you. That's beautiful. Now give each other a hug. We're supposed to do that, right? Um, so uh, just to, to get started, we're going to talk to a good friend who wrote a great book, Principles. This is Ray Dalio. And, and Ray, Ray thinks of himself, and we all think of ourselves as just ordinary. He says, I'm an ordinary guy. And, and when I talk to him about being ordinary, I ask, and this is what we want to learn today, how does an ordinary guy uh, go from being ordinary to being acknowledged by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people on the earth? Um, how does an ordinary guy build a company that Fortune Magazine says is one of the top five most influential private companies in the United States? Uh, and, and how does a person who starts with from a, uh, a, a, from a Long Island background, works hard, has a challenge time in school, end up being one of the 100 wealthiest people on earth. So we have a good fortune of spending a little time with a good friend of mine. We have traveled, we've been diving, we've been in remote places. I've watched him in action as he listens and learns and talks to everyone with the same honesty and integrity, whether they are a village leader or a village member or the head of a Fortune 500 country, company. So. I'd like to ask good friend Ray Dalio to come out and share some time with us. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's a special treat to be able to speak to you uh, because I'm at uh, the end of my second phase of my life and you're at the pretty much the beginning of your second phase of life. I think that basically life exists in three phases. You start off... Your phase one is you're dependent on others and you're learning. Phase two is that you're working and others become dependent on you and you're trying to be successful. And then you get later in stage two and you're, the number one goal that you want more than anything else is to help people be successful without you. Then you can go to stage three, which is, you know, you're sort of free of obligations and so on. And um, what I did uh, over a period of time, whenever I would encounter uh, situation and make decisions, I would write down the criteria for making decisions. So uh, my number one objective is to tell you that um, you need to have your own principles. I'll explain some things, but uh, I'm going to share some of my principles. I hope they're helpful to you. There are things that have worked for me um, that I've written down over a period of time. But number one, the, uh, I want to describe this experience to you. Whenever you're in a situation and the, if you take the time after that situation and you write down your criteria for making decisions, then you will have that for the next time that thing comes along. And this, what happens is the same things happen over and over again for the same kind of reasons, but you don't see that. You're operating um, in a way where you, know, you take them one at a time. And so I would recommend to you that you write those principles down. When you do that, you, start, you think about them in a deeper way, and then the people that are in your lives then start to understand how you're behaving, and they can be partners in that idea of meritocratic decision-making so that they can also say, is that the best way to operate uh, and deal with that situation? And so you start to think in a more principled way rather than all of these bits and pieces of different things. So that would be my recommendation. But what I'm going to do is take you through a little bit of my journey, and it, it's totally cor correct, as Peter says. I'm really a, a very ordinary guy who, through trial and error, discovered some things that worked that helped me do what Peter was describing. So what I want to explain is, like, we, we look at um, the world, and, you know, there are just so many different things to have principles for. Principles are um, essentially recipes for dealing with situations that happen over and over again. Uh, and, you know, like there's just a million things. You could study, uh, you could be a doctor, you could be a physicist, you could be someone. And the things that I understand and spend time with was economics, investments, and then work. And um, my approach was largely captured in this slide, which is to say, like, I would go after audacious goals, and then I would succeed and fail. And most importantly, uh, 
benefited from failure. In other words, I had, you go after your goals and you then encounter your problems or your failures. And how you're dealing with those problems is one of the most important things. I started to realize, for reasons you'll probably see as we go along, that pain plus reflection equals progress. In other words, that painful situation, if you can diagnose what produced that failure and then develop principles for dealing with it different at a different time, in a different way, and then you take those principles and you improve, you learn, you change things, then you go, you improve and you make uh, better, go on to more audacious goals. And the way I look at life is pretty much like it's this looping process, this evolutionary loo loo looping process that means you go after your audacious goals, you fail, you learn, Failure is an important par par part of that process. You learn principles, you keep improving. And so I think that I learned that there are only five things that you need to do to be successful. If you do these five ways, five things, you will be successful. And the first is um, to be clear on what your goals are. You have to know what you're going after. Um, you can't have everything in the world, but you could have almost anything you want but you can't have everything you want. If you go after your goals and you're, they're clear, you have to know your goals. And along the way, number two is you have to identify and not tolerate your problems. A lot of people um, tolerate problems. And then you have to diagnose those problems to get at the root cause of those problems. And often the root cause is you. Maybe you have weaknesses, maybe you make mistakes. And with that, uh, or maybe somebody else is making mistakes. We all have strengths and weaknesses. And the power of being able to know our strengths and weaknesses and know how to w deal with them is enormous. And only when you know what your problems are and you diagnose that specifically can you create a design to get around those problems. And that design, very specific design, you go get around the problems and then you have to, if you have a design, you have to be reliable in doing that. And everybody is um, bad at some of these steps. And the key is to work with other people who are good where you're weak. So I just want to give you a, a sense of um, failure. I think the, probably the greatest problem of mankind, that's a big statement, biggest problem of mankind, the greatest tragedy of mankind is individuals who have in their minds wrong opinions that they're attached to. And they could so easily stress test those to put them out there and find out if they're um, strong or weak in terms of those opinions and to move beyond that to make better decisions. And it's a tragedy because it could be so easily dealt with. You can reduce the chances of being wrong by properly stress testing them. And I want to take you through an experience just briefly of what happened uh, to me that changed my whole approach to decision making. Uh, this was in 1980, 81. And I had analyzed that uh, American banks had lent a lot more money to emerging countries than those countries were going to be able to pay back. And that we were going to have a debt crisis, a big debt crisis. And I thought that that would have a very bad effect on the economy. And that was a very controversial opinion at the time. Uh, got attention. Uh, and it turned out in August 1982, Mexico defaulted on its debts. And a number of other countries followed. And so that very controversial point of view was right about the debt crisis. And as a result, I was, uh, got a lot of attention. I was asked to testify to Congress, and I was asked to be on Wall Street Week at the time, and I want to just give you a uh, clip from there. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mitchell, it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be able to appear before you in examination with what is going wrong with our economy. The economy is now flat, teetering on the brink of failure. You were recently quoted in an article. You said, I can say this with absolute certainty because I know how markets work. I can say with absolute certainty that if you look at the liquidity base in the corporations and the world as a whole, that there's such a reduced level of liquidity that you can't return to an era of stagflation. Arrogant? 
I was incredibly arrogant. I couldn't have been more wrong. That was, that was the exact bottom in the stock market. And we had this decade of success. And it was extremely painful. I lost money for um, me. I lost money for clients. I lost so much money that I had to borrow $4,000 from my dad to pay for my family bills. I had to let people go. Um, it was really terrible. But it turned out to be um, probably one of the best things that happened in my life because it changed my approach to decision making. In other words, it uh, gave me a humility, a fear of being wrong that was to go with my audacity. And it let me stress test my thinking. And so what I wanted, it gave me this notion, how do I know that I'm right? The thing that I learned is um, being successful is, has more to do with knowing how to deal with your not knowing than anything you know. And if you can then think, how do I know I'm right, and stress test yourself, and find people who disagree with you, the smartest people you can find who disagree with you, and you have thoughtful disagreements so you can take in and, and stress test. Not only does it provide a lot of learning, but it stress tests your decision raises your probabilities of being right. And so I have this company, this little company that I'm building, and it changed the way we are operating. And this is sort of what I want to pass along to others who, are, who have companies or operating in companies about this way of operating. So what I needed was independent thinkers who also had audacious goals, who would go after those together and would challenge my thinking and we would challenge each other's thinking and try to get to the best answer. And I realized it didn't have to come from me. And so I needed an idea meritocracy. And I'm going to try to explain how that works. And through that idea of meritocracy, we have then these principles. By writing down our principles and those shared principles of how we were going to deal with things together, we would have better communications. We would deal with them better. And that produced, it, produced successes and failures and learnings. And the learnings produced happier employees, this idea of meritocratic way of operating. And it produced more independent thinkers and more audacious goals. And it produced the success. And so it was from that learning, from that very painful experience that I went through, that it changed my approach to decision making to create an idea meritocracy. So what do I mean by an idea meritocracy? I want to be very tangible for you. Um, in order to have an idea meritocracy, meaning, in other words, the best ideas winning out, wherever those ideas come from, you have to do three things. And the first is that you have to put your honest thoughts on the table, honest thoughts on the table, for everybody to see and, and look at. And one of the problems of most groups of people, most organizations, most individuals, is that they don't want to be honest, and they don't like disagreement. And so, um, you know, you can go out to a restaurant and somebody says, I like the food, somebody's not going to be reluctant to say, I don't like the food. Where thoughtful disagreement is the second thing. You have to understand the art of disagreement. Because if there's disagreement, that means somebody's going to be wrong. And how do you know the wrong person isn't you? So you have to understand the art of thoughtful disagreement. And then once you have that disagreement to raise your probabilities of making better decisions, and, and that certainly happens if you do it well, then you have to have ways that are going to, idea meritocratic ways of getting past your disagreement. In other words, you have to have protocols, and we do something which we call believability-weighting decision-making based on different people's credibilities. So that's what I mean by an, uh, an idea meritocracy. And I'll, do you want an idea meritocracy? Do you want to operate that way? Do you want to have thoughtful disagreement, not emotional problems, curiosity to make yourself more likely to be right? And do you want to uh, abide by protocols that'll help you get past that disagreement? So, um, the other thing is, you have to know what people are really like in order to have a meritocracy. And everybody has strengths and weaknesses. So the real question is, do you want to know your weaknesses? Do you want to know each other's weaknesses? Because if you know each other's weaknesses, um, and you're all going to be better off if you're dealing with that in a forthright way, knowing your strengths and weaknesses, because that's what makes up a great team. So when you know what someone is like, you know what you can expect for them. 
That's a power. So an idea meritocracy is that kind of organization. I want to give you just a quick clip of what, how that works, how we try to bring up uh, information. There are many different tools, but what I found is that in order to be effective, I needed to have um, tools, apps, and things that were operating by that would facilitate that. So I'm going to take you into a meeting and give you a flavor for one of the tools and one of our methodologies for uh, operating that way. A week after the U.S. election, our research team held a meeting to discuss what a Trump presidency would mean for the U.S. economy. Naturally, people had different opinions on the matter and how we were approaching the discussion. The dot collector collects these views. It has a list of a few dozen attributes, and so whenever someone thinks something about another person's thinking, it's easy for them to convey that assessment. They simply note the attribute and provide a rating from 1 to 10. For example, as the meeting began, a researcher named Jen rated me a 3, in other words, badly, for not showing a good balance of assertiveness and open-mindedness. As the meeting transpired, Jen's assessment of people added up like this. Others in the room had very different opinions. That's normal. Different people are always going to have different opinions. And who knows who's right? Let's just look at what people thought about how I was doing. Some people thought I did well, others poorly. With each of these views, we can explore the thinking behind the numbers. Here's what Jen and Larry said. Note that everyone gets to express their thinking, including their critical thinking, regardless of their position in the company. Jen, who's 24 years old and fresh out of college, can tell me, the CEO of the company, that I'm approaching things terribly. This tool helps people both express their opinions and separate themselves from their opinions to see things from a higher level. When Jen and others shift their attentions from inputting their opinions to looking down on the whole screen, their perspective changes. They see their own opinions as just one of many and naturally start to ask themselves, how do I know my opinion is right? That shift in perspective of going above it and seeing the full range of views shifts the conversation from arguing over individual opinions to figuring out objective criteria for determining which opinions are best. Behind the dot collector is a computer that is watching what all these people are thinking, correlates it with how they think, and communicates back to each of them based on that. Then it draws the data from the meetings to create a pointless painting of what people are like and how they think. And it does all that guided by algorithms. Knowing what people are like helps to match them up better with their jobs. For example, a creative thinker who is unreliable might be matched up with someone who is reliable but not creative. Knowing what people are like also allows us to decide what responsibilities to give them and to weigh our decisions based on people's merits. We call it their believability. Here's an example of a vote that we took where the majority of people felt one way, but when we weighed people's views on the basis of their merits, the answer was completely different. This process allows us to make decisions not based on democracy and not based on autocracy, but based on algorithms that take people's believability into consideration. Yeah, so we really operate that. I, I, I just want to give you a, a, just highlight some things. First of all, anybody can criticize um, or any, anybody on the basis of a non-hierarchical approach. So we're bringing out all the complaints. Um, we capture that, uh, uh, that information. So that way, uh, we're building a meritocracy, an idea of meritocracy that people believe is a fair system so that there's weighting on that, on the basis of, you know, capabilities. And so we do this believability weighted based on data. And so nobody is going to be able to be hierarchical in that sense. You can make the decisions based on the quality of the thinking, and that can evolve over a period of time. People learn their strengths and weaknesses. 
And then we have behind that data, lots of data, because all every day everybody's getting a 360 degree uh, review from that. But also we're seeing how they themselves make decisions and we process that data in a way that everybody thinks is fair. So people are on this mission together. Uh, my, my goal um, has been to have an idea meritocracy in which we want to have meaningful work and meaningful relationships. Meaningful work meaning you're, like you're on a mission together and meaningful relationships is that deep relationship but through radical truthfulness and radical transparency. And then we use those algorithms to help us. Okay, so what's the problem of doing this? And I think it's a, you know, an ongoing problem. Why is that difficult? I think that um, it's what I call the two U's. I've asked neuroscientists and psychologists, and everybody agrees that it's basically that there is a logical, conscious you, and then there's a subconscious, emotional you, and they have a struggle with each other. So if I would ask you, would you like to know your weaknesses? Or would you like to know what I think even if it's critical? The logical answer to that would be, yes, I would like to know those things because then I can deal with them better. But emotionally, that becomes a challenge. And so as people start to wrestle with each other, as they come in to the organization, they come in there wanting to know those kinds of things and have that radical truthfulness. And that radical truthfulness uh, brings about stronger relationships because everybody knows you can't, um, uh, uh, that truthfulness, you'll get it. And by this transparency, this radical transparency, so almost everybody can see everything. We tape everything for everybody to look at, almost everything, so that there's no spin, there's that reality. And that has been the basis of being able to have that idea meritocracy, and that's been the challenge. And it's not for everybody. I would say probably a third of the people just can't get through it, a lot of people struggle. And then on the other hand, uh, we call it get the, getting the other side. When they get to the other side, when they're used to it, they can't work any place else because it's, they can't go back into a typical organization in which all of that stuff is hidden and there's politics and there's lack of sincerity and there's uh, the associated um, problems with all of that. So, uh, so I want you to go with, with these four questions. Um, and it's up to you to decide what you want. But four questions are, do you want these things and in what degree? Do you want to have an idea meritocratic decision-making process in which the best ideas win out rather than the individual thinking, you having the power, a hierarchy? Uh, and then you know what that means. I defined it before. Do you want to know what you're really like, your strengths and weaknesses, and what others are really like in order to uh, get at the best results. Do you like this truthfulness? To what extent do you want to have truthfulness? And to what extent do you want to have transparency? If you don't have transparency, you're going to be listening to everybody's spin on situations. Do you want to have those things? And then, the and then beyond that, there's a great power for being able to turn those, um, any of your thinking into algorithms. Do you want to have algorithmic decision making? A lot of what we're doing is this data, and through the data and algorithms, we actually have the machine, the decision making machine, run in parallel, like playing a, a chess game uh, through a computer and um, doing it in partnership with the computer. So I'd like you to think about those things. Then you could think about how to get them. That's what I was trying to convey. We've, we've built a bunch of uh, tools and apps and things, and we're gonna make those publicly available so the people who wanna do that, like the dot collector and those tools, will have the opportunity to be able to uh, operate that way. We're gonna make them available. <laughs> So that's it in a, and maybe a little bit too long a way, winded way, but uh, thank you, and we'll take some questions about it. <clears throat> thank you, Ray. That's, that's, uh, it's brilliant, and I love the, the generosity of, of where you are in your life. I mean, that you've built a great company, you've, you've learned, written down over 25 years what you've learned. You, you, you didn't just try to remember what your principles are. You actually have been gathering them over 
over two and a half decades. Uh, and so what you're talking about is an operating system that can apply to basically any company in order to actually ensure that it endures, because that's really what you're after. It's long-term impact, effective endurance and success. Um, so it seems like it would be an obvious, you know, how do I do that? Give it to me. I'm ready to go. But you've been talking to many different businesses. And as you talk to friends and colleagues that are interested in this transition, can you describe what are the barriers and the hurdles that they run into as they try to implement this? And, and, and how do you coach them through it? Well, first of all, I, I think that any group of people or any relationships benefits from the definition being very clear of how you're going to be with each other. You built an organization. People who are growing their organizations need to be able to be crystal clear. So there's no getting away, getting around the idea of writing down those principles. It's just so powerful. Then the question is, do you want to do it? Can you get in the habit? And I think each of your, uh, the people here can do that. We're going to put out an app, which we call The Coach, in which, uh, besides having some of our principles, will be a vehicle for you writing down <clears throat> your principles. So habit, write down the principles when you're dealing with it and be clear, share those principles. Um, and then um, if you want these things, then the, the big issue is um, how you implement it. And uh, the, big, the big barrier is the emotional barrier, but uh, people start to react to that individually. They sort of see the struggle with themselves and then they overcome it. And it's a matter of getting in the habit. We call the process getting to the other side. You know, somebody gets hired, they say, I really want this, is great. great. And then, um, then they go through the process. And, at, and then that's sort of shocking. It takes a little bit of a, adapting to it. And then, we, then they get past it because they start to realize that they, other people are not, do you want the other alternative where there's not that clarity? And we call it to getting to the other side. So it's a process that people go through. But I think everybody's gonna be saddled with those questions now. So do you, how are you going to be with each other? You could do it any way you want. Just write it down and be clear. Yeah, it's really, for me, as, I, as, I, as you have discussed this with me over years, and as you have taught me, as, as we, have, have we have traveled together and worked together and learned together, um, you know, I, I have seen as I've applied it in other situations that people don't really like to talk about failure, right? It's, it's more, let's get on to the success and let's not talk about the failure. But your phrase, pain plus reflection equals progress, is kind of at the core of that. And could you just dive into that a little bit more? I think a lot of, I think a lot of life is that the Second order consequences are the opposite of the first order consequences. In other words, the things that you like, maybe the food you like to eat, the exercise that you don't like to do, uh, all of that, this is one of the great tricks of life, that the second order consequences are very, very beneficial. And, the, and life is sort of tricking you, that it says, okay, which ones of those are you going to operate by, okay? And so failure, for example, I don't wanna talk about failure. I don't want to talk about weaknesses. I'm saying, go to the pain. Go to the pain. And before you know it, the pain becomes pleasure. Because um, what I've, my, my whole mentality starts to change. I realize um, that if I have pain, um, I start to view it as a puzzle. And I view that if I can solve that puzzle, which means what would I do differently next time, I will get a gem, and that gem is a principle of what to do next time to learn. So I've developed a habit that I actually have the second order consequence reaction to the pain, to the failure, yeah. that makes me know it's a learning experience, and so it's that dynamic in life. Don't be tricked by the first order consequences and really enjoy those second order consequences, go to the pain and view it as a puzzle and then you'll get gems. Yeah, you know, I should just say that the first time that Ray did this with me, uh, I think you were in, in Connecticut and I was driving 
down a dirt road in Brazil in which you talk to me about radical transparency and what you would just learn from somebody that was counter to what I've been telling you. And, uh, and I didn't get pleasure out of that. It took me a while to actually understand that, that listening with an open mind, not actually thinking about your response while you're being taught is actually uh, the way you get to the place where you can learn. Both parties, that's a thoughtful disagreement. When you're totally honest, radical forthrightness, and you know you don't know the answer, but it becomes a common question as how you can work through with good intention. It's the idea of tough love, yeah. you know? Uh, uh, we're gonna hold each other to high standards and try to get at the right answer together, yeah. but it's gonna be tough. Yeah. Um, so, so now that, that you have put into your extraordinary company, which is one of the most influential in the United States, uh, the concept of radical transparency, and this is something you've developed over decades, and, and I guess the question I have is, when new people come into the company, um, what's their reaction? Is their reaction, this is dangerous? Is their reaction, this is different, I love this? And, or do you weed those people out in the interviewing process so that, how do you do that? Well, we show them, we show them, because we record everything, we could show them lots of instances. We make them aware, yeah. and it's sort of like an intellectual Navy SEALs. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> do, do you want this thing? And everybody's going, you know, okay, I want that thing. So they make a choice, maybe some people don't. And then they come in, but like the intellectual Navy SEALs, you know, they say, yeah, I really want this thing. Then when they get in the icy water and they don't get to sleep, you know, it's the equivalent of then they go into that experience. And then they're wrestling with each other and then they come to love it. But the thing about it is the meaningful work and the meaningful relationships. In other words, maybe like the Navy SEALs yeah. or some, when you are tight with somebody and you have that genuine caring that they know that that's part of it. We have, um, I think we have 1,500 people. I think that there are like 104 or clubs and organizations. I made a policy that anybody um, who can come up with anything that's fun to do, that could have 20 or more people up to $500 per person, will pay for half. In other words, just go out and build those relationships. If you've got those great relationships and you know that they're being tough on you, for those good reasons to try to get at the answer and you know where your goal is, then they come to love it. Most people, um, there's a period of time, maybe it's about 18 months, which is associated with behavior modification. You know, people then say, okay, I've got that. Past that period of time, people don't want to work elsewhere because it's very difficult for them to go in an organization where right. it's all behind yeah. the scenes and it's phony. And So if we have hundreds of entrepreneurs in front of us that, that are now starting their businesses or recently they've launched their business and they love this idea and they want to embrace it. Do you suggest to them that they go all in or do you suggest they test it with a small leadership team? How do you actually see whether this is going to work in your place? Well, uh, yeah, test it. You have to define how you're going to be with each other and you'll live it out. So the question is, can we be radically truthful and radically transparent with each other? Well, the it's answer is you have up. been, we have been. But I'm saying they I know, know that. Just... With their partnership. Yeah. They, so they're going to yeah. have to deal with that question. Yep. Um, so as they're going through that, they should experiment with it. Uh, the reason I put out the, the books is at very nitty-gritty level, you can look at the questions and then experiment with it. If you know your, your vision of where you want to go, like, that, do you want to have an idea meritocracy? It's the goal level. Once you've got the goal level, then experiment. So is it the top circle? Like a number of companies, I won't drop names, but big companies right now, interesting cutting edge companies, the top 10 people in the company, because there's usually most companies or organizations, maybe there's a group, top 10, then they'll experiment, do they want to be that way with each other? They start to experiment with it. Do you want to broaden it? And they have to find what's right for them. Yeah, and, and I just say, want to tell you that I find it to be absolutely extraordinarily open-minded, clear, and wise. Um, and so, so to start with, 
again, I just want to thank you for that, that clarity. But what's interesting also is that, as you and I have spoken, we got to go through an arc in our life, right? Um, and you are in that spot in your life where you are thinking, how do I share these principles with the rest of the world? I just want others to pass it along and others take it for whatever that they find it worth. But why? It's a why, why have you reached this place? I, I, think it's very, I think it's very natural. I mean, I think you experience it. One of the things that a lot of people don't understand is how the priorities change in various stages of life. And I think that as you get to be a certain age, it's like a parent with their kids. Um, what do you want? At um, one age, you want to help guide them. At another age, you, when you're a certain age and they're a certain age, you want them to be successful without you, right? You want to pass that along and you feel that kind of responsibility. And then you le relieve yourself of that responsibility by um, doing that passing along. And so I'm going to pass it along. I'm going to pass the tools along. I'm going to give that out. And then I'm going to disappear. In other words, I'm not, you're not going to see me. I'm not, I don't, you know, there's the public thing I don't like too much. And uh, how much time do you have left before you disappear? Uh, probably a year for the tools and so yeah. on, something yeah. like that. Um, and it's a stage of life thing. Joseph Campbell wrote a book. There's a book, wonderful book, Hero of a Thousand Faces, and he goes through the life arc. And it's so good for you all to almost think, where are you in your life arc? And what does that arc look like? And what will you encounter? Uh, because you actually don't pay much attention to it. So it's, it's a life arc thing. So in your place, in your arc, you have, um, one, you're giving this gift to the world. And it's not just, here's some principles, read a book, but you are actually on the road talking to people to try to educate them as to why radical transparency and relationships are totally essential for effectiveness. Which feels for me like almost relieving myself yes. of it. Yeah. And you also have other passions. Yeah. And... And what you and I have spoken about a bit is your passions for ocean, for exploration, for communication. And, and, and I know that you think everyone needs to pursue their own passion, which I respect entirely. Tell us why this is your passion. Well, I've, uh, I've been deep in the ocean and I've explored, and it's, uh, it's thrilling and it's also important. So the way I look at it is, um, if you look at the ocean level, it's about the, the world above the ocean is about half the size as the world below the ocean. The biggest peak is equal to the deepest trough. It's almost symmetrical, but it counts for 72% of the world's surface. And so that means two thirds of the world is under the ocean and nobody has really explored it hardly at all. And so if you love exploration, it's like, it's better than going to another planet. If you want to see aliens, you're going under the ocean. You're not going to see them up there. And so that, that it, first of all, it's thrilling and then it's important because the ocean is our greatest asset. I, I won't go into all the reasons why because we're going to run out of time. But it is our biggest and greatest asset. And it's not appreciated. It's so important in terms of the whole climate issue. It's so important in so many different ways that we could get into. So I think it's very impactful. I'm excited about impact. My, my, my goal in life is pretty much to evolve well and fast and contribute to evolution. And so that's my way that I'm excited about doing it and um, I'm feeling that I'm having an impact. So we're going to, um, I have a, a ship that um, is, um, has uh, subs that go down through to, um, thousand meters that scientists use and we know media most of blue planet too we shot on it we discovered yep. giant squid that kind of thing we're doing another one and we're going to do um an initiative where we're going to have like jacques Cousteau, a series uh I'm, I'm doing that with james cameron uh that we're going to have a, a series that people are watching then a lot of social media so that there's that engagement so people could not only explore but they can be there uh, virtually with other explorers so that they love it. You gotta love it first, and that's why I'm excited about it. Yeah, I love that you're doing that. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you for that. 
So we are living in an economy right now uh, that is pretty hot, but we have a increasing polarization between the haves and the have-nots. How would you fix that? Well, let me, I think, describe just briefly the mechanics of it. I think okay. it's very similar. Uh, there are um, economics is, economics and markets is my day job. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so um, I think it's important to understand that what we're in is a period of time that's somewhat analogous to the late 30s in that um, in 19, there, there are all these debt cycles. There's a short-term debt cycle, long-term debt cycle. And in 1929 to 32, we had a uh, debt crisis, and then interest rates hit zero. The only other time that's happened is 2008. We had a debt crisis, and interest rates hit zero. Because interest rates hit zero, the ways that the central banks dealt with that was to print a lot of money and buy a lot of financial assets to push those asset prices up, to lower interest rates, and to push liquidity into the system. And that caused a lot of assets to rise. With that, that contributed to a wealth gap. Uh, there were other reasons, technology and so on, for uh, producing a wealth gap and also a divergence. And so that, uh, today, the top one-tenth of 1% 1 of the population's net worth is equal to the bottom 90% combined. In other words, a big, wealth, giant wealth gap. And that was the same last time that happened was the late 30s. And so we're in a situation when the economy is at a peak, um, we still have this very big tension. That's where we are today. We're in the part of the economic cycle, which is the later part of the cycle, because as you start to run into capacity constraints, unemployment rates are low and so on, central banks begin to put on the brake and they begin to tighten monetary policy. So we're nine years into this uh, expansion and the capacity to deal with that is different. So we're in a situation where um, if you have a downturn, and we will have a downturn, I believe that that, I worry that that polarity will become greater. I, I think that the unity of us, how we approach our problems together is a very important thing. If you look at the condition, capitalism basically is not working for the majority of people. Uh, it, that's just the reality. And, um, uh, and yet there's opportunity. So we've got to make uh, it work for the majority of people. And you're in a situation where, like today, the Fed did a study uh, that the 40% uh, of the population could not raise $400 in the event of an emergency. I mean, it gives you an idea of what wow. the polarity is. And we often don't have contact with that world, but that's a real world. So that's an issue. Um, and then I think we're also in an environment where, uh, for the first time since the 30s, we have um, a rival power in the form of China emerging to be in a competitive situation with the United States, which is going to be um, a, you know, an issue. So it, I think it has to be dealt with. If, if I was doing it, I think that you have to call that a national emergency. And you, uh, if I, the president of the United States if they declared that a national emergency, that wealth gap and that opportunity gap, and then created metrics that literally judged um, the conditions of people and then took responsibility for changing those metrics. I think there's a lot that can be done in private public partnerships and so on to be able to uh, change it. But um, I fear that that probably will not be done by the next time we have a downturn, and I fear for what that uh, conflict is going to be like then. Yeah, I think that we all are afraid of that, and, and uh, that number of, of that you gave of families could not raise $400 is shocking. And the education system. You know, uh, my, my, my wife um, helps public education uh, in Connecticut, and Connecticut is the uh, richest state in the union. But just to give you an idea of the wealth disparity and the impact, <clears throat> um, she d deals with public schools with the worst kids in the public schools, and she uh, uh, supported a study that um, examined what are called disconnected and disengaged students. A disengaged student is a student who attends school but doesn't study, they just get, are there. And a disconnected student is a student that they don't even know where they are, they don't come to school. 
22% of the high school students are one of those. They're going to, those students are gonna be on the, on the streets. And you go to schools and um, they share books. In some cases, they literally share pencils. They'll take a pencil and they'll either pass it back and forth or break it in half and sharpen it from both ends. The conditions are, it's unfair, it's, in, you know, it's an intolerable thing. And so those things are not being dealt with. I, I, so anyway, I, I think that that's a real problem. There's a lot of justification. We have to make the system work for the majority of people. If you look at the wealth gap, there's some, if you're interested, I've got these studies that I did that are on LinkedIn, you can go on. I broke the economy down from the top 40% and the bottom 60%. And I picked 60% because that's the majority. I could have picked 80%, the conditions are basically the same. And if you look at that 80% economy, it's a bad economy. The death rates are rising from opiates, from suicides, the usefulness is declining. I mean, it's, we have to deal with that. Yeah, we have to understand that there is legitimate fear. Legitimate fear. Um, Ray, I think that we have a whole lot of people out there that would like to ask some questions. So, so why don't we just start out with some questions and we'll start over here on Thank you. my left. Uh, Ray, first off, your philosophy is completely genius, and the fact that you have taken over the last few decades all these thoughts and shared them with all of us in the world is truly remarkable, so I just want to acknowledge you for that. Um, my question is, as you were beginning to realize uh, how these principles changed your own line of thinking and then turned them into uh, ways that you made decisions, how did you choose to invest in the technology that allowed Bridgewater to make the best decisions as a team? Um, I started by every time I would make a decision, I would write down the criteria. I, I did it basically because when I would close out a trade, I wanted to then, then see how my thinking worked. And then I stumbled across the idea that if I can make that clear enough, I could test how that decision would have worked in the past. I could run it through all countries, all past period of time, and that gave me a reflection on that decision rule. Then I discovered that actually if I could take that criteria and put it into an equation, I could take in data and it would sort of say, bring it to me, and I would make those decisions. And so I, I, I stumbled across the fact that writing down the principle, making it an equation, allowed me to be able to test it, and then also allowed decision making to be uh, happening in that way. And so that one thing then let me do that on all of the ones that I was making decisions and making, and we would do it together. So it was so great because ordinarily we were sort of saying, what would our decision be? That's bad. If instead you think, what, are our, what should our decision making criteria be? And you could test it and convert it into algorithms, that's good. So what happened was that, um, the vast majority of our decision making over a period of time was able to be made this way. So 98% of our decision making is made by algorithms with us arguing about our criteria, not our conclusions. And that, so that's how it developed. And then um, I, I realized that I could take it to everything. I could people decision making. In other words, all that data that's collected that you saw, we could create algorithms. And by looking at those algorithms for people management and how we're gonna be with each other, it, it became the logical extension. So that's how it evolved. Sir. Hi. Um, your, firm's, your firm's investment performance has been one of the best in the world over the long run. Uh, please share with us two or three, sort of the top two or three you know, insights, methods, qualities that you think have made you one of the world's best investors. Okay, quickly. Um, first of all, I learned that uh, Almost all the surprises that happened to me were things that just haven't happened in my lifetime before, but happened repeatedly in other lifetimes or in other countries. So I needed to have uh, criteria that I call timeless and universal. By specifying the criteria and then seeing how they would have worked in other time frames and um, other locations, timeless and universal, that has helped us a lot because then if there's a difference in another time frame or another country, I'm forced to explain that difference and be able to do that. So that's one of them. The idea of separating what I call alpha and beta, uh, 
what should, if you had no view, what is a balanced portfolio like to be able to have diversification of assets to achieve balance? The power of diversification to reduce risk without reducing return allows you to increase your return to risk ratio enormously. Um, in the book, I show this, uh, what I call the holy grail of investing. So whether that's done for a strategic asset allocation mix or whether that's done for taking bets, that has been a key thing. I'll, I'll call it the holy grail of investing. So you might want to look in the book because there are people standing behind you and I got to answer other questions. But I would say um, the knowing what we don't know and how to deal with it well is, is, has been key. So Ray, um, I just want to switch for one second because you're talking about radical transparency as it is in your work in Bridgewater, in the business you've created and the rationale that brought you there. I mean, the mistakes you made, how you learned from them, how you copied, how you wrote down principles and how you actually really scanned this over decades. Have you applied the same in your family? Of course. I mean, meaning, look, in any relationships, you are going to have to define how you're going to be with each other. I mean, people just sometimes don't talk about it, but there, there's a big benefit. Like for me, I can say, um, th these are my principles. You can read it. You can hold me accountable to this. This is what I will do, and you will know it, and this is what I value. And when you have that in a family, do I want to be radically truthful? I could tell you s stories of, of difficult situations in which um, you know, one story, my, uh, my wife was um, a possible dying of cancer situation in terms of that. And, and I wanted to take my kids through it when they were young to take them through that so that they know that they could always trust in what I'm saying without spin. So that radical truthfulness and that radical transparency. Now, I want, it's not, it's radical. It doesn't have to mean absolutely everything. I just want to be clear. I don't, uh, it, you know, there are certain things where um, if somebody is going to be hurt by it, you know, you make the judgments. But it's, uh, yeah, because you have to decide how you're going to be with each other. The good news is that Barbara was fine. The good news is Barbara okay, was fine. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, question. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I have a question, however, I noticed that there's no women online who might get a chance to ask a question, so I want to see if there's any woman who wanted to take my slot. Great. So, Thank you for that. Hey, Thank that's you. great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you well so done. much. I really yeah. appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Ray, my question for you is how, what's your advice on how we can reconcile the feedback? I don't want to call it negative, but it, you know, when we're getting no, feedback. Looking at negative is good. Okay. So how can we reconcile that, you know, when we get that feedback on ourselves about our weaknesses to internalize it and improve quicker? Uh, I think the only question is getting at whether it's true or not, right? And um, in other words, if you don't, if we're working together and you don't believe that it's true and you're in that situation, it may not be true. And then how do you find out in an evidence-based way? Do you do a, a, a test another, or do you do triangulation? You have to really want to find out if it's true or not and realize the benefits of finding out if it's true. Because this is the key to the success of life. The key to success for life is you don't have to do it alone. You find out what you can do well yourself. You know, there's two paths uh, of finding out that you have a weakness. The most common path is, if once you get that you find out, the, one, the most common path is, do I make that a strength? And that may be a difficult path. Maybe, um, you know, people who think one way might have a challenge thinking another way. But the easiest path is to find out who's good at what you're not good at and appreciate those differences. And then, yeah, one, so I think the answer to your question is to try to do it in an evidence-based way with the realization that you're gonna be so much more successful and so much more happy if you do it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Yes. Hi, Ray. Hi. What do you think about universal basic income? 
I th uh, universal basic income, um, I did, by the way, I did a study on it, and it's on LinkedIn if you're interested in looking at it. I looked at it um, uh, for a, a lot. Um, the basic uh, issue on the universal basic income is that they believe that you will lessen the, you'll take money and funding it by taking programs that are in existence and eliminating or reducing those programs to give people the, the money to be able to make those decisions themselves so that they can make those decisions well. And so I think it's really a question of whether you, when you shift that, whether you're going, whether that will allow them to make decisions well because they're good decision makers. In other words, uh, when I look at education and I see a number of things, um, I know that I want, and I'm dealing with certain populations, I want to make sure that that is being given, the money, the cash, is being given for an effective purpose that they will use well rather than the program. If I'm going to take money from education or I'm going to take money from other things, I have to be able to believe that it will be done well. And it's a difficult question. You know, so some populations, I think there's a real benefit to it because it eliminates the bureaucracy and it eliminates people spending, um, making decisions for you. Because you, if you're a good decision maker, you know your, um, how you're going to spend that money and allocate the resources effectively. It's a better way of operating. But there are a lot of par percentage of the population who can do more harm than good. So that's what I think about universal basic income. I think that there's also income and usefulness. I, 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 think, it's, I think both are important. But I think you have to make usefulness as an important part of it. So in my view, like, I, I, I'm crazy about microfinance. I'm crazy about um, ways in which you can effectively make usefulness, make people. I think that basically, if you, uh, I had the benefit of parents who cared about me, loved me, and I had a school that I could go to in which I could learn. And so there's basic things that you need. If you have basic uh, education, fundamental education, which is not being dealt with now adequately, and you have a, a family in, that is a, a difficult family environment that does not that type of care, you need that. And I think then you need an opportunity, like a, a, a microfinance, a little bit of money with an opportunity allows that to be uh, paid back. Uh, so I'm very big on microfinance in terms of being able to provide opportunity. For every dollar that I donate in microfinance, over the next um, ten, uh, five years, I think, excuse me, 10 years, it's 12 times that mo amount of money gets lent and paid back to people, and it becomes self-sustaining. So those are the things that are more my passion than universal basic income for those reasons. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Rick. Um, you mentioned education a few times. What solutions would you provide to our education system right now to take steps towards meritocracy at a societal level? I think the, the biggest uh, problem in education is, well, besides not recognizing it as a great national priority, is the, that the Constitution makes it statewide and then within the state, the school districts are, uh, if you're in a rich school district, you have taxation that will pay for a better education than if you're in a poor school district. And that we don't create a bottom. There's, there's no bottom to that society. And so I think there's a structural problem on that. So I think it should be uh, treated as a national emergency. You have to say that that's intolerable, that that it exists. And then you have to find the ways of getting around that. I do think that private-public partnerships in various ways um, are, are big issues in terms of dealing with it. But I'm not an expert on education. I spend a fair amount of time with it. Um, I think that there are a lot of people who are doing wonderful cutting-edge things to, to do that. I put together a group of people, a commission, who also lives in those, po those areas that are dealing with... Um, it's a poverty question as much as it is a... Uh, um, um, a uh, education question. In other words, when you go home at night, what is your situation? There are a uh, lot of kids who don't have adequate food, and they go into situations in which um, there there are shootings. And I, I don't. That sounds ridiculous, but 
it happens in so many different areas. I can tell you many towns that I know of in which they go back into a traumatic environment. Yet there are very cost-effective ways of dealing with that. I can rattle them off. For example, um, after-school programs. You have an infrastructure there with the school system and the school is there. And it creates a problem when you send the kid home at three o'clock in the day. Because it's a problem for the kid and it's a problem for the parent. Because what's a single parent, a single mother gonna do? Now she's gotta take care of the kid at three o'clock in the afternoon and you could cost effectively extend that to a full day program. And you can also then bring back the enrichment programs because the enrichment programs, things like art and the fun learning types of things that they can do are being carved out of the school system and they could be brought back. That could be done cost effectively. The difference of a high school student completing high school and not completing high school is, is approximately a million dollars in their lifetime. Because of the issue, if you don't complete high school, you're going to be on the street. The cost of crime, the cost of incarceration, it costs incarceration, is between eighty dollars and $120,000 a year in the social cost, as well as the injustice cost. That's so per person. Per person uh, uh, for incarcerating somebody. Yeah. And those people who don't complete high school don't have a, a future, and so it's not fair for them. In order to have equal opportunity, I mean, that's the thing that we want to strive for, equal opportunity. That's what the country is the greatest at, and that's what we should be striving for. You have to have something like equal education. And so I think all I'm saying is I think that those could be cost effectively dealt with, but our societies needs to be able to put that money in, in one way or another. So public-private partnerships that could do that, combination of philanthropy and government, and look at the return on the investment that you're going to get. It's a fabulous return on investment. And there's a lot of that stuff. Do you think, Ray, that, that, that enough people that have means understand the precariousness of the state of our place and the need for making these kind of important analyses and investments? Uh, no, nowhere near, OK? So how and do that, you get there? It's understandable. You, you, you focus on scale. I mean, mm -hmm. you, always think about scale. Hmm? How do you scale up the wisdom you've just shared so that actually we have an opportunity to, to educate the people that have the chance and the means to make the changes that are essential? Theoretically, you, you want leadership at the top, right? You wanna say, I, that's intolerable. And, and, and there's a population that speak, speaks to it, but there's, it, it, for two reasons, we don't see it. Uh, we're not living in those neighborhoods. We don't go into those schools just personally. I mean, this is a wonderfully intellectually enriched crowd, and by and large, we don't have that. So I would say if you can have direct contact, I, mean, I would say, by the way, it's an incredibly enriching experience to see the world through those people's eyes and to empathize with them and so on. It, it's fantastic. But, and then you look at averages. In other words, the average unemployment rate or the average income, the averages are misleading. So how would you know, right? But I would say it's an adventure in, it, go into that school, see it through their eyes and then feel it. Uh, but some way or another, you gotta deal with it and you gotta raise it. I think more likely that we won't adequately do that and then we're going to encounter the consequences. Eventually it'll beat us over our head, but it may be too, antagonistic yeah so so um we have now gone over time um and and before we wrap it up um you know i just want to make one comment and that is that um that you are an ordinary icon i mean you have actually in the way that you have lived your life the way you've looked at your family, the way you've looked at your passions, the way you've searched for innovative breakthrough ideas and approaches to business uh, is, is unusual, really unusual. And it actually is very, very hopeful. Uh, so, so I have seen what you have touched. I've seen the way that you have challenged people around you. I've seen the way they have risen and they have actually responded and what you have created in many different ways. Um, before you kind of go into this arc of disappearing, I would love you to think about how do you take what you have learned 
about transformation and about integrity and about honesty? And how do you scale that up into the community of people in our country and around the world that need to understand that they need to go to those places in order to understand the opportunities? If you do that, then we will allow you but, to retire. Uh, I, I think, <laughs> thanks, but I think, I think the real thing is that you really have to understand that I'm a really just an, I mean, a, like I uh, barely got into uh, high uh, college on probation and I, you know, just a number of, uh, I'm a very ordinary guy who stumbled on some of these particular approaches. And so the thing that I want to do is to pass those along. And after, and when you leave here, if you just think, is that, does that have merit? Because it's, it's, it's you all, right? In other words, so there are so many of you and you could do that and you could change that. And then if you do it, then you could help other people do it. So, so is that the takeaway? That's the takeaway. It's up to you now. You got that? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Well done. Yeah.